Hey everyone, and welcome to our weekly ecosystem office hours call. I am your host Jinx, and we are joined as always by the best and brightest in the pocket ecosystem. Got a great call lined up today because we are going to at long last see the demo of the uh, AI workbench tool that Ramiro and company have been working on. But first, let's get some updates. Shane, protocol updates? Uh, yeah, there's there's not uh, anything uh, specific to. Well, I, I actually I can I can mention that um, tokenomics. Uh, Ramiro has actually uh, created um, a Python version of uh, TLMs, which are token logic modules, which is uh, the idea of having a kind of more modular approach to tokenomics. Um, so he's created an initial TLM. Uh, we work together to basically establish, uh, I think it's five small, uh, five TLMs. One is a uh, mint and burn. Uh, kind of base TLM, and then we have a supplier boost, validator boost, DAO boost, and sources boost. Um, so, anyways, it's yeah. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a cool system. Uh, he just posted, I think, either yesterday or today uh, to the repo uh, to a, a GitHub repo with it. So, basically, the team will will take that and start scoping it out. Um, in terms of future visibility, uh, they no longer. So with with a lot of Groves restructuring, um, they're no longer hosting uh, the weekly um, or biweekly uh, meetings that at least I'm a part of. Um, uh, and I don't have visibility into uh, Discord as well in, in terms of like the uh, the day to day stuff of the team. So in terms of future updates on the protocol itself, I don't really have visibility into any of that now so someone from the protocol team will have to take on that responsibility uh of making those kind of announcements or or you know keeping folks up to up to date on uh their progress you got it if you want to uh, reach out to me after the call and uh, just kind of let me know the the scope or domain of of what uh you want to report on or or if any at all just let me know and i'll adjust the uh intro meeting agenda accordingly okay yeah sounds good yeah i i suspect i can still help with you know just kind of general updates or pnf updates but in terms of protocol team itself uh i i don't i don't have visibility into that anymore so you can take that you right off. yeah gateway updates fred anything uh, of note yeah uh riffing kind of off the changes that grow that have happened over the last week um, we're making some big changes to the gateway. Uh, we're working towards an open source solution quickly. So that's going on in the background. Protocol development continues as expected. And uh, most importantly, probably to this audience, is that we are in the process of reducing our regional footprint drastically with the existing Grove portal. Um, this hopefully will not affect end user latencies. And we don't expect that to affect anything, but we are reducing our footprint to just three regions. Those will be U.S. East, EU Central, and Singapore, which are known and colloquially known as the big three. Uh, but that, that is something that we are actively working towards. Um, right now, we are currently live in only three regions, and we plan to deprecate the infrastructure, assuming no major shifts in network behavior. Beautiful. Thank you, sir. And uh, Porters? No, I guess not. Oh. Sorry okay. about that. Go ahead. Just, I mean, just wanted to respond to the call out, but no, we don't have much to report. Um, going through Windsor's some troubleshooting this morning with the uh, um, issue on our pocket node, but other than that, um, we have again two possible chains that we're looking to bring on to the network. Um, things are moving slowly there, not entirely unrelated from you know the happenings within this community but uh yeah we're optimistic that we'll uh we'll be able to sign them on here in the next couple weeks beautiful sounds good well we'll keep an eye out for that 
And are there any other gateway updates or people that I don't recognize yet who are gateway representatives who have anything to check in on? Thanks. Can I add something about gateways? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, we, we are still uh, waiting for the other way, uh, gateways to join to know this on the metrics uh, for the quality of service times. So everyone on gateway that is using gateway servers, please, if you can reach us, uh, even in public channels, let us know to, to coordinate so we can track your metrics, please. Absolutely, and I will uh, reinforce that. If you are running a gateway, please uh, work with the pocket scan team to get your metrics included in the analytics that they put out. And with that as a transition, I'm going to hand things over to Ramiro to give us that demo that we've been waiting a few weeks for. Jinx, and uh, well, finally. <laughs> um, we are going to do this presentation with Nicolas, so I guess he will be starting. Can you share your screen? Yeah, you see it? Yep, I yep. see. Oh, well, let, let me do oh. a, a first introduction and about this presentation. What we wanted to do here is to present like a closing recap of all the work that has been done in the socket, in the AI lab socket that has been open four months, I think from March to June. And uh, well, like to summarize everything and, and present the, the benchmark. So that's what you should expect of this. Go on, Nicolas. So yeah, yes, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Nicolas and we are going to present the work done as Ramiro said, during the last uh, four months as part of the Pocket AI Lab Socket. So uh, this is not moving. Yes, now. Uh, first of all, we are going to make a summary, a brief summary uh, of the main four contributions. Uh, then we will also do a live presentation by Ramiro Rauthut uh, for a deep dive into the benchmark, how it works, and some results. And finally, we will leave the microphone open for question and discussion. So the first contribution is the uh, Pocket Square project. This is a, a MVP uh, where uh, an agent uh, uh, that uh, uses a tool called uh, Retrieve uh, Augmentation Generation to to, well, to retrieve the information about uh, the address of an Ethereum account, like uh, the balance. So this is not in currently development. So we are uh, asking for uh, some help. If someone wants to contribute, you are welcome. Um, here you can scan the QR code. Um, then the second contribution is uh, how to serve uh, machine learning models, uh, you know, uh, LLMs, large language models, and latent diffusion models through Pocket Network. So uh, there are main, uh, three contributions in this aspect. The, the first one is uh, all the, the code and the, the, the dockers and all that uh, things uh, to, to deploy uh, these two kind of models. You can find this in the uh, repository here. I think it's in the model deployment in this folder. So the second contribution in this aspect is uh, we fixed the pocket climb timeout on machine learning calls. You know, uh, blockchain's uh, responses uh, are very short in comparison to language models. So we fixed that. And we added, uh, we changed the pocket core code to allow uh, the increase in the RPC payload, payload uh, size. Uh, before it was hard coded to one megabyte, now it can be configured in the config JSON. So, for those who don't know, the latent diffusion model is the one that we use to generate images, oh, for example. Yes, this is for image. Uh, and that's the responsible for needing. Uh, payloads larger than one megabyte because meshes can be big. Yeah, thanks. Uh, the next contribution is the pocket 
ML sidecar that is quite related to the net contribution, but uh, uh, we, we discovered that we need information related to the uh, machine learning model uh, uh, assigned to a specific node. Uh, for instance, this is the tokenizer information, and probably we are, we are uh, looking to, to add the, some configuration related to the model, specifically, specifically the max uh, context length that is part of a uh, config of the model. Um, so uh, to solve this problem, we developed a lightweight sidecar uh, to patch this. Uh, this is a fast API with an Nginx deployment. Um, so this, uh, this contribution it has not uh, yet a, a name, so we can think for a name for that. Um, so the question is, why we need the tokenizer? This is related to the next topic, that is the model referencing discussion. And we know that uh, we cannot, for instance, enforce a uh, model specific through pocket network, like say the Llama, uh, Mistral, and so on. Um, so we decided to, to advocate for the optimistic inference approach. This means um, everybody can join the network and serve an LLM model, for example. We are going to uh, evaluate it uh, and not force uh, anything. So um, how it's, we, we are going to, to check that a model doesn't change uh, during time is through uh, signatures. For instance, that signature will be created from the tokenizer. So if a node change, uh, we are going to know, uh, for instance, by the tokenizer. And if a node uh, change but maintain the tokenizer, then their metrics, as we are going to see, will be practically uh, garbage. So this is um, this is the only thing the pocket ML sidecar that, uh, for instance, we are enforcing. That is only information related to the machine learning models. Um, any question so far? Okay. So the main contribution is the pocket machine learning testbed that will be presented by uh, Ramiro. Um, this is a permissionless open LLM model leaderboard. We, are, we can see the address here. Uh, and here are the benchmarks. And here are the results. So the, the spirit of this was to replicate the open LLM leaderboard by high phase. Now it was updated, but if we go into here, this is the, the old one. So we can see here the, the same benchmarks, like here. So uh, we're going to see that. Ramiro, would you like to? Yep, I will begin? share now and continue. One second. Just let me close this. Can you see my screen now? Yeah. Great. Well, as Nicolas said, uh, our main focus for our main contribution is actually this table and all the backend behind it. And what why we wanted to create this table is because when we as LLM users wanted to know about model, we went to this other leaderboard, the open LLM leaderboard from Hugging Face. Well, uh, just a little, this is an archive as Nicolas says, because the, the table changed uh, this month. So we weren't able to update our presentation, but we'll do it soon. But these leaderboards, what they do is they show a list of models. These are actual models and all their metrics on different kinds of of data sets. So when a new model comes or, or you have a given model, you can just search here, Llama 3, for example, and it will tell you all the, all the metrics for a given model. And you will make your choice depending on what you are looking for from uh, an open LLM model. So we wanted to replicate this 
but to have it done for the pocket network. So instead of models, we will have nodes and we will provide the same metrics so that this table and this other table can be directly comparable. So I can compare this kind of Lama 3 with, for example, this node here. That will be really easy to compare and it will be really easy for LLM users to know what kind of, of LLM is behind this node because while we cannot enforce a given kind of model, we can measure how it how that model behaves on our network and tracking it through the time. And also provide other information that is useful for the pocket network, like for example, the latency or the success rate of this specific node. This, this now numbers are just a mock-up right now, but they are really easy to obtain. We haven't done it yet. And then we also will provide links to more detailed information in pocket scan, for example. So this table is important not only for LLM users that want to see this, want to know what kind of models are there in the pocket network and have an easy way to relate them to bigger models and other kinds of open models. But also it's important for gateways that want to know how they must route their traffic. For example, if they get a session with these four nodes, they can use this information to route uh, a given prompt to a specific model. So they will probably need some kind of this information. And this uh, site will provide also in the future, we'll have an API access here. It's all working, working progress here, but we'll have an API for this. And another thing that is important in pockets is, the, is that the nodes are not static. Here, the no, there is no nodes. There are actually models that you can download. So the data is static. But here we have nodes. And nodes can change through time because this is permissionless. And we will also plan to provide the, the, this metric through time, like little graphics. So the main idea of this table is to be able to have a quick uh, comparison between what Pocket Network offers and what an LLM user wants to see. So you may be asking, well, why is this so hard to do? Because these guys here already done it and they provide a, a, a beautiful about and how they do it and provide all the software to do that. Well, the problem is that the Pocket Network is really special. Uh, it's not a problem of the Pocket Network, it's a problem of the problem, in fact, is that first, we are not testing nodes that resides in our servers. So the access to, to those models is intermittent. We have sessions. Sessions can terminate. The, the node can refuse to process a given prompt for any reason. They're, they can fail. Also, the nodes can change through time. And we need to be able to handle all, all these edge cases uh, safely. And the, the software for testing models, LLM models right now is not able to do that. So that's why we created all this backend. And now we will see how this backend works because it, I will try to do a short recap of all the things that we built. So you can understand how, how solid it is actually. <laughs> so let me present here. So how this uh, leaderboard works? Well, we did this as modular as possible, and we created it using four different workflows, all managed by a temporal I.O. server, and a MongoDB to, sh to share all the information about the pocket nodes. And then it's uh, Postgres, SQL, just to hold data sets. But uh, the bigger pic big picture here is that we have a manager that communicates with the pocket network, retrieves all the nodes that are in different services or chains, then decides what kinds of tasks or, or metrics it should have for each of them. Then it will go to a sampler that will create uh, a given prompt. That means all the RPC configuration needed to process that kind of metric. We'll have a requester that will just take uh, a prompt and make an RPC call to the pocket network. This is the only part that we will need to change to, to make 
this this leaderboard work in Shannon. We only have to change the requester and a little bit of the manager. And after the request is done, the, the answer is saved and the evaluator evaluates that metric and provides all the information needed for the manager and the cycle continues. So it's really, really easy and it is easy to configure thanks to thanks to temporal IO. This is just a screenshot of the temporal IO where we can see that the, the manager and all the other workflows are scheduled and triggered for a given task on a given chain or service. And when it, the temporal IO decides to execute it following the schedule, it leaves traces of all what happened. So it's easy to debug and see how this, uh, how the test bench is operating. So I will hit now do a little run through how, what happens when a new node enters the network. For example, we have a, a or our benchmark is, is running. We have the leaderboard created and a new node enters a given chain that we are observing. Then the manager will automatically pick that node from the, from the pocket network state. It will look if it has that node in its node database. And if not, it will start asking for signatures that are, for example, the tokenizer or the configuration. It will do so by calling the sampler the sampler will create all the information needed to create uh, to make the RPC call to the specific endpoint to get, for example, the tokenizer signature. Then we'll come the requester, we'll make the RPC, we'll receive the response, and it will write it back to the MongoDB, and it will call the evaluator. The evaluator will take the response, finish the task, and provide the manager with all the information it needs. What we obtain in the end is in the MongoDB, we will have for each of the nodes in the network, uh, all the information like the address and the service. And using the, we'll have, for example, a buffer of signatures. And each of these nodes will end up having a signature of the tokenizer and the hash of the tokenizer, because we take all the, all the data around the tokenizer and create, <clears throat> and create a single, a single hash to to make to it's easier to track that. Yeah, than just a technical yes. comment, uh, just to point out that uh, we can ensure that if the tokenizer change, the model change. Yeah, yeah, that, that's that's another feature. That's why we call it signatures. We, you see that we talk about signatures and numerical stuff like a one thing because this can hold anything and a tokenizer is not only a tokenizer of a given LLM model, but it's actually a way to tell if a model changes because if the tokenizer for a given node has changed, it means that the model has changed. So we have to scrap all the metrics that we had and start all over to, to have to track it correctly. So once you have the signatures of, uh, of a given LLM, in this case, the tokenizer, you can continue the, the testing. And this time the manager will, when it cycles again, it will look for this node, find that it has all the signatures, and it will start performing all the required metrics to build the leaderboard. It will ask for the sampler, but this time for a given specific metric. The sampler will go to the Postgre that database, will take all the data that it needs from the database, create all the prompts necessary. And a given prompt from, this is, this is important, why, why a task ha can have many prompts? That's because in how the LLM works, the LLM test works, a, a task, for example, a single question from a data set for uh, that you have to do to an LLM, for example, it's a like multiple choice questions with four answers. You have to do one prompt for each in order to calculate how sure the LLM is on each of the different responses, A, B, C, or D, for example. So a task can have many uh, prompts. So I, just to create a single data point, you need, maybe need to do like four different RPC calls. So this is how this is why 
we separated what a task is from what an instance and what a prompt is, because a single task can have up to four, well, or even more than four prompts. But for the requester, this is all the same. The requester will take all the prompts, will do all the RPCs, and will write the responses back into the into the into the database. The the requesters. Oops, is is the one doing the relays. So that means that for a given task, you can do up to four relays, for example, in the pocket network, and it will be writing back the responses, the raw responses from the pocket network. Then it will call the evaluator. That is the one that has the, that will evaluate if the response written into the database is actually the response it wanted, if it's an error from pocket, if that error is an error that should to your a retry, for example, evidence seal, meaning that the node did not respond because it has uh, exhausted the number of requests that it will uh, answer for a given session. So it handles all those things. And if everything is all right, it will write and calculate the actual metrics for the manager. And finally, the manager will update the leaderboard. So this is like a really complex uh, way of of creating all this, uh, but we did it. Oh, sorry, I missed this. Uh, the the end result that we have is that for each of the nodes, once again, we'll have in the buffers numerical. This is a buffer of numerical samples. We'll have, for example, for the framework LME, that is language model evaluation harness. We will have the for each of the tasks that we are testing for each of the node. We'll have like the scores and the mean scores, the median, and, and lots of and, and some metrics that we will use later to be populate the, the leaderboard. And, and this is changing all the time. These buffers, it's, it's rather complicated, but they are actually circular buffers that will be overwriting. So it's like a, a moving average of the quality of a model. So it, it's all created for a dynamic system as opposed to a, a static system that is what the language model evaluation harness library expects to evaluate. So this, uh, this uh, so the, the test bench has these features, like it's really scalable. Since we have different four different workflows, we can scale them horizontally in Kubernetes we can deploy them really easily and and make them be ready to support like th thousands of nodes as we hope that we will start evaluating it is fully configurable so we can tweak how much uh, how many requests are we do are we doing exactly and how often are we checking and so on these are these are really interesting things when we deploy this into a, a big system like the pocket network and no, the, the the software that is available today to test LLMs can't do that, this, or, or we have not found any software capable of doing this. And finally, and more importantly, it, this modularity means that the tests that we are doing today are not the only kind of tests that this software support. We can change this to support other kinds of models, for example, diffusion models that have other kinds of tests. We can Repurp uh, just change a little bit of the sampler and we will start testing other kinds of metrics that are interesting for diffusion models and provide specific leaderboards for them or other kinds of leaderboards that are interesting for other types of implementation, all depending on what the, the users of the pocket network want. So we are not married to the LM evaluation harness, and we think this is very important too. Oop. So, another thing that you might be actually wondering is, oh, are these numbers actually accurate? Because you are seeing little bits of numbers there that you you don't know what actually are behind those no those nodes. Those those could be all also make up, but they don't. We did our homework here and we tested this, how we should be testing this. We did this like how it will work in the in real life. That means that we took the code from the MLTV and we deployed it in a local net, in a Morse local net 
that have faster blocks and, and fewer nodes because it, it should it's be able to run in my MacBook. <laughs> and we use the lean and mesh code from the ones that we are using today in Morse. So we tested this under the same uh, environment that the Morse mainnet is today, meaning that all that we did here locally can be done on mainnet. And we didn't test only the, the simpler, the simplest prompts like complete or, or generate until a, a, a given number of tokens. We ask for the API for any kind of of calls like providing the the, the log probability of tokens and, and things that are really specific. So we tested truly all all the open API through the pocket network. We did this experiment with three different language models. We tested a Llama 3, 8 billion. That's uh, probably once of, one of the most versatile open models that we have today. Uh, and probably one the one that was being used by Group, I think, because it's one of the, of, of the most small, it's like, the cost and and what it provides is like the sweet spot there. We also tested the, uh, another one, this, the DeepSeq coder. This is a, a very specific model for coding assistance, for example. And then we tried a, a small one, a tiny llama. This is like, we use this for testing and it's not so serious stuff, but it's a language model nonetheless. We configured the testament to have a minimum network load. So we only needed to do like 10K relays per model in order to get all the all the all the data that we are seeing on the on the on the leaderboard. And the context length was maximum of 2K tokens, uh, 2000 tokens, and models mostly hand, handle 4000 tokens. Uh, we reduce the sampling. This is really important. Most uh, tasks, there are 63 tasks for the language model evaluation harness, and each of these tasks can have up to thousand of examples that are processed by the by the models. We only tested 50 of each, 50 samples on each of these tasks, meaning that we did a reduced sampling, but we knew that the results should be okay also. There are a paper there that we have telling us this. And then we measure how correct our results were compared to the OpenLLM leaderboard, since we knew each of the models that were behind of the nodes that we deployed in our local net, we could go to the to Hugging Face and check for the results. And we obtained a high correlation, 0 0.89. And this is really near one that is perfection. And uh, the p-value is below 0 0.05. That means that our test is statistically um, meaningful. That is, we tested enough to say that you can be confident that this correlation number is accurate. So it was great. And if we go through model by model on each of the of the metrics you see here, for example, the tiny llama on each of the metrics that we tested, we see that the the reference model, that's the, the red stars and the values that we measure that are the blue ones with the error bars are not that far away. This is actually the worst of all, but it's not that different except in the Hellaswag. But if we go to the DeepSeq coder, we see it's almost perfect except for the ESM 8K. This is a really, really difficult data set. So it's almost what we wanted to observe. And also in the LAMA 3 instruct, it's like following the same shape. And one, this means that the metrics that we are doing on a reduced uh, version of the, of the LME, of the language model evaluation harness, is actually accurate, and we will probably be able to infer that a llama three billion, eight, a llama three eight billion model is behind the a given a given uh, node address, and that's that's really really important. This is like a summary of the table that we observe in the in the report that is also in the 
in the repository, you will find all the reports and, and the last one we, we do we do all this analysis and, and, and fill this table. So what's the future work from now on? What, what are we planning to do with all this? Well, the first thing that we want to do is deploy this on mainnet. We think that we have shown that we are able to measure how a language model behaves on the pocket network. We have created a system that is easy to scale. So we only need to deploy and see how it behaves and, and start uh, whitelisting LLMs so we can start having metrics. But there isn't much to be done to, to have this working on mainnet, actually. The, there is, we have not found any, uh, any problem in running any of the requests that a language models needs to be done on pocket network. So the only thing that's holding us is only having to whitelist an LLM. After that, we want to create this public site that you have, I have shown you today. Uh, we want to make it an actual site and host it somewhere and also create an API. So the the gateways can use this data to correctly select nodes in a session for their clients and iterate on that and see what the the gateways or the users of this of of the of the test bench want to have in an API and, and keep on building them. And after that comes what we call the fun stuff because we can start expanding this, not only the test bench, but also the pocket network to different kinds of models. For example, we have already tested that diffusers, these models that create images from prompts can work in the in the pocket network. We are sure that visual language models, those models that understand not only prompts, written prompts, but also images can be deployed in the pocket network. We, we actually see no problem for doing this or also any other kind of of model, for example, like segment anything models that are models that segment images. They should work also perfectly in the pocket network and we should be able to create tests for them and check the accuracy of any kind of model that we put on the, on the network using this same test bench. Then the test bench is also created to support custom tests and generative tests, for example, like tests that are generated for, by other kinds of language models or any kind of tests that the community wants to do or very specific ones for very specific tranches of, of work. It, we can add all this. We can add model signatures or model watermarking to specifically select who, models that are of a given family if and only if the watermark is provided by the by someone. There are some little things to, but we can at some point be able to recognize some types of models, or even in the future get to some kind of on-chain approach where we can leave a trace on-chain that we have been testing this, doing some specific things, and that that would be really interesting to have. And after that. <laughs> We say sit and wait because we build this to meet all the standards of the ML community. I mean, we are using bleeding edge things here, like the tests that are being used by everyone. And we are doing this very seriously, meaning that we take our time to have all the, all the parts created. So you cannot say that we are faking our numbers. And we hope that the ML community will see this and not, not only be attracted by the fact that they will be able to put a model in the pocket network and earn some, some coins through it, but also be able to contribute to how we are measuring the models. How, we, how is the golden standard of models will be evolving in the future because this is a a problem that is constantly evolving in MML. How do we measure these models? So a community-driven measurements of ML models is a really interesting thing. And, and I think that the ML community will be really excited to see 
that we can not only provide services for ML models, but also test them on the in, in the wild, like in the model that is being used is also being tested. And that test is really open and they can contribute to it. And well, that was the, the end of the presentation and thank you for, for your attention. Sorry for all the technical details, and I hope that you have uh, get what you wanted from this presentation. So now we, uh, we are open to comments and questions. Thank you, Ramiro. Uh, Shane's left some questions in the sidebar there. He got four questions to start with. OK, so how many relays are involved in, involved in doing each of these tests, uh, like 10K per node to get a full picture of a node at a given point in time? And the request a session will be uh, how many requests a sessions will be this QoS test? We can configure that. It's it's all a trade-off on depends on how much time you want to wait until you have a clear picture of a node and how many relays you want to push for QoS on each session. So it's all fully config configurable. But if you are expecting to wait like three days, for example, to get a sample of a given node, that the number of relays that you will be doing in a session will be really, really low. But it also depends on how many nodes there are in a given chain so and how many apps do you have available to do it. We have done the math. <laughs> it's like uh, a really nice graph uh, that I want, that I like to do, but the the final answer is that we can configure that and it won't be like the 50 percent it will be less than than the 10 percent i hope then um, so, yeah yeah uh, yes shane uh, will folks we be able to know what question come from your uh, quality of service i understand and have a predetermined response ready to all the score high um that could be a way um but the thing is that uh, some of the prompts uh, have also some few shots, and the way that a few shots are selected is randoms. So you have to have a very, very huge database with all the possibly prompts from a related task. Yep, that was the second question. No, yeah. Yes. Uh, the third one is: is the is is the evaluator another AI that is trusted in the house if, uh, to determine if a response is correct? No, there is no AI here. It's, there are data sets that they are public and yes, they can be cheated on, but the idea is to make this so complex to cheat that it will be easier in the beginning to just deploy a model. And once we get into the point in time where we are famous enough that people want to cheat us. That would be great. We will we can do other kinds of tests, and we can start doing generative tests, for example. And, and just yeah. uh, for an example, imagine that uh, we gave to an um, a node uh, some I don't know 20, 50 random words, and say to predict the next 10 words. Uh, that's completely random, and but is uh, have to be determined if the model is maintained. So if I give you different words and you predict uh, each season a different kind of words uh, in a generative way, that means that you are faking. Yeah. And well, on the final one, how does the tokenizer know that an AI model has changed on a node? Uh, the tokenizer is like the language that an LLM speak. So if you change that language, you have to change the LLM. That's like a, a raw metaphor on how, what a tokenizer is. That means that there are many LLMs that use the same tokenizer, but not an LLM that use two different tokenizers. So if the tokenizer changed, the LLM changed. So it's like if you change the language, you have to change the one talking to you. Because you, this, the things cannot speak to tokenizers. Well, if it's 
if it's uh, 10k requests to complete a test, how much of a hardware burden is 10k requests? How many requests can a model handle with a specific piece of hardware? Uh, the hardware request, the requirements for doing a request is negligible. It's like really little. It's just go for to a database, pick some examples, and push a request. So it's nothing really complex. The right. requirements of the yeah, Nico. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, regarding to how many requests can handle a model with a specific piece of hardware, that's completely uh, that's something that we can know uh, because if the model is quite small, the oh. requests are huge; it can handle uh, thousands. But if the model is uh, in a in a term of uh, model weight, I mean, no. But if the model is uh, heavy, a big, big one, like uh, I don't know, uh, thousands of uh, billion. That take quite a long. So yeah. that's not possible to know. Moreover, there are different techniques that can be used. You can have, uh, I don't know, this is very technical, but uh, you can have two models with a same tokenizer to, to accelerate your inference. Yeah, it, it all depends on the hardware and the model that you're using. For example, in, in, our, in our setup with a 40, 70 GPU, uh, we could handle like thousands of of requests at the same time for a llama, for a tiny llama, but we can only manage to get one of uh, llama 8, 3 billion. That means in parallel, then, then you will start, the, all the software that is done to, to provide this service can start doing queues and so on. So you will get your response later in time, time but you will get your response eventually yeah ian how can we standardize prevent a variety of different injected system prompts by providers hosting the same model i'm not sure to understand that question but uh, can you uh, develop it more ian Uh, I, I, I really didn't understand also, Ian, so please, can you elaborate a little more? Uh, um, on, on, on my question, I, I guess what I'm not sure about is if, you know, on the small models, you said can handle thousands of requests. I don't know what that means. You mean like an hour or do you mean like... In parallel, I was meaning. In parallel, so at, at any given yeah. second, it can handle thousands of requests in a second. Yeah, well, we are so... particular. We are using a BLM engine in the example. So yeah, can be. Yeah, it, uh, your hardware, the speed of your hardware, we will enable you to provide to create, for example, one token a second, just to put a round number on it. If you can run more in parallel, you will get more tokens in that sec second. So, but to improve the number of parallel prompts that you can process in that same second, you will need more more memory. So it not only depends on the speed of your hardware, but also in the amount of memory that your hardware has. So right. it's really specific. The, the throughput of an, LL, of an LLM depends on hardware and how you deploy it. There are like lots of things, moving parts there, yeah. So what, what I'm saying is you you tested with a, sev or a, a, a 470. Okay, so you tested with a 470, you had a specific model on there. Uh, with what you're saying is with some of these models, you know, you can handle thousands of requests a second. So it would be able to go through one of these tests in less than, or, you know, in like a, a two seconds or three seconds. No, 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 never, no. no. This well, that's test... what I'm trying to understand. How much of the hardware, like for a given model that you tested, how much of the uh, resources went into doing these QoS checks? Because they've got to have constant QoS checks happening. Plus, they've got to be able to handle other requests from the network to which they make, you know, their return on. So I'm trying to understand how how much of a burden are these requests? Uh, Actually, they will be paid also for QoS tests like today. So okay, sure, but how how much of it is is in house? 
you know, how much stress on the hardware do these tests, you know, take? That's something that we have to measure. There is no other way to know beforehand what kind of hardware will the the providers of the pocket network will have. So once we know how much time they take to process a given prompt and how much prompts at the same time they can accept, then we can know what's the throughput of the pocket network. And once we know that, we can just configure the the test bench to say, okay, we don't want to disturb a, a given node more than 10% of their time in QoS checks per, per session. And that will tell us, well, if you want to do that, you will have to uh, wait, I don't know, five days in order to get uh, an, an accurate prompt, an, sorry, an accurate measurement of a node. If you are willing to pay those five days of lagging uh, metrics, then there is no problem. So but with there the, is all, always a trade-off. So with the with with what you already tested with with your current, I understand that with different hardware it's always going to be different. But with like what you tested, I guess with with your hardware, is you know how long does it how how you know how how long does it take to go through these ten thousand requests? If the CPU is completely uh, focused on that versus if it's only doing it, you know, uh, you know, if it's doing yeah. it more spread out. Okay. Like, well, it, in it, my computer with my MacBook doing the relays and uh, another computer being used to do the inference, it took around three, four hours to get a full picture of an out. Yeah, but the thing is that we have not a uh, dedicated environment only for LLM engine. We run it on our own machines. Yeah, with all yeah. the and, and and much of that uh, of that time was not that the uh, that the GPU was at the hundred percent. It was also the delays that the manager had because if the manager didn't trigger again, it it waited. Five five minutes until triggering again the manager and request for more and more and more more metrics. So there is like a lagging thing that I cannot give you a a number. Actually, the number that you are want, that you want is like how many how how much time do you need for a single GPU to process a, a given test? You can do we can do it with with the LM evaluation harness suite because you want to know how much time of 100% GPU usage you are consuming in to create one of these. But uh, it's not very much. It's not like it is two days working all, all the time only to produce these metrics. That's, that's why we use a, a reduced set of, of, of samples. We don't use the whole data sets. We only use 50 random samples to, provide, to create a, a given metric, and that reduces a lot the time that you need to to infer what kind of model is behind a node. Um, yeah, Ian, uh, you mean by the context? How it's the context? We know how hundred. That's something. That's uh, it's one of the uh, addition to the. Um, uh, ML sidecar, the the know how to inform its uh, max contents length in future version. By now we know how many. Uh, uh, okay, tokens. I know. I know. I understand what what Ian says. Yeah. That what what if uh, a provider is injecting the prompts that we are sending? It injects far, further text into it. Well. If, if we give you, for example, a prompt to say, who's the president of the United States? And you inject part of the prompt, like you put a system prompt in, in at first and saying, you are GPT-40. Now there is a question for you. And then you put our prompt there. That's like injecting the prompt with some extended context. The problem is that if you don't correctly handle the the number of tokens that you are going to provide us with uh, 
with uh, log probes because we will ask you for the log probabilities of each of the tokens that we send to you. You will fail the, the test because we will know that the prompt has been injected. And if you do your homework and correctly change all the log probes and provide us with log probes for each of the tokens that we send to you, then there is no problem because the prompt injection will con make make a condition over the output of the LLM, but we don't care about that. We only care about the response. If if the prompt is always injected with the same text when a user uses it, so be it. That's how your LLM works, and we don't care about that. We only care about the results that you are sending us and if they are correct or not. Amiro, you have a question from Tony there too. Oh, sorry. Uh, how many relays would it take to run a basic inference request? Only one. Uh, for example, if you want to ask who's the president of the United States through Pocket, you will just write that, send it to a gateway. The gateway will wrap it up and send it to an LLM, do one relay, and you will receive your response. Yeah, from there, Tony, the interest question, I think that is how much it will cost. Yeah, the, the we are we were working on some Yeah, that have to cost. be to the count, yeah. pocket count. Uh, we have been I mean, discussing this. Uh, we have been discussing this with uh, Olshansky too. Uh, we are not ready to to show anything, I think, but we expect this to be cheaper than than the average uh, than the average service because well it's it's a new thing and it should be cheaper but you, we have some plans on how to achieve for example different contexts with different prices but we we have to discuss and have have something cleaner to present you on on that front and then Shane asks about spoofing right after that. Uh, the problem is it's not that easy to spoof. Uh, for example, I have a script that has all the data sets and checks if the questions come from these data sets and gives you the correct answer. OK, in theory, you sure. could do that. But it's not as easy as uh, compare string for string, because all the all the prompts have little variations in them. So you, you will have to put a little more effort into that. Nevertheless, we didn't say it's, it's impossible. It's possible to do that. Now, as the security of any system is comes to question like, which, what is easier to? to do here. It's easier to deploy a model or it's easier to code a program to spoof the pocket network in order to get some tokens. And knowing that when I do that, we will probably realize that because we will be sending other kinds of requests to your model and see that it returns garbage all the time. How much time will we will it take us to create some other, for example, signature that is able to capture when you are spoofing and making all your work worthless. So there is like, a, like in any security model, there is a cost benefit here that right now is really low, but we expect to, uh, but we created this to have all the, all the tools to, to make our game difficult to game in the future. Yeah, I see it being difficult to game if you have a dynamic system. But if this is, uh, I, I, I don't think it's really that hard to get the, uh, you know, kind of get the the list of question, or get the get the list of what the questions are. Uh, there are thousands of them. That is fine. But all all you have to do is do it once. You just have to go through no, that whole list. No, because there are thousands. And they are also created on the fly because you are given you give examples to the LLM for each question. So, so from those thousand questions, you select n randomly and you compose right. a question. So 
the actual set of all possible questions is really, really big. So it's not like you have to do it once. Well, here, so here, here's what I'm thinking. Okay, so someone has a, a, you know, the proper model, right? They run this, they, they, they run themselves. They run these questions one time. All the questions, all you know, thousands and thousands of questions, right? Take all those answers. Then they can simply have a script that simply looks for any of, you know, they now have answers to all of those questions, and then they don't have to regenerate that same answer they can uh, with their actual LLM model, because if they see the same question come in, they can just share the response they already have. And it only takes one person to share one response to all questions for, uh, uh, you know, for anyone to, to spoof this. So yeah, the thing is that indeed, it's not important, the question, Jane, the important is the log props is the probability for each token. Yeah, yeah, but you can have that also in memorize. But the the effort of doing that, Shane, is, is greater than you think. And the effort for us to evolve from this is really, it's really small. And, and we actually are already thinking of, of creating generative questions because we know what you say. And, and, we, and I agree that that possibility exists. The problem is that creating it, it's not so trivial. And and making it useless is really easy. So I, I you you can try, you can do it for of course, but I don't think that you will earn that much money from your effort. Indeed, uh, once you can check, or I, I'm thinking in there. So you can ch uh, send uh, the the questions the for a specific uh, task. But you can track the, the log props, then you can send again that prompt, but modify the uh, temperature. Uh, that log props should change always yeah. if you modify the temperature of the model. So if the log prop remain equal, that's, that's cheating. Yeah, that's cheating. There are many but, techniques to, yeah. to, to play detective. Tony asks if the Provided that bad actor would exist, good slashing be enforced. Uh, right now in Mars, there is no slashing. So slashing will, should start only with Shannon. And we are not planning any QoS related slashing right now. But there would be uh, a challenge mechanism, I think, for slashing. So And we could enforce it from the test bench in the future if we wanted to. And then if the cost of usage is higher than token minting, who would do that? Oh, well, yeah. We will have to make sure that creating a response is cheaper than the number of tokens that you will receive. Yeah, that's the tokenomics of this. But given that we can just set arbitrary, uh, arbitrary token weight, uh, Relate to tokens multiplier for the different chains. We 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 can set a higher one for LLMs. That's something that we will do probably. It's not that LLMs will have the same payout as a, as any other blockchain LLM. That Shannon is prepared for that. Okay, Ian, will token length, context size, response size be factored in the rewards for a relay? Yes, but not on a relay per relay basis. So we'll probably have different tranches for them, but this is all to be discussed. Uh, say that the single term world system question one is one relay, is 100 questions still be one relay. Uh, and then two questions with the same sentence length can result in answer with either a short or a very long response. Yeah, that's, that's all true. And to handle that on Mars, we need to create different different services. There is no way that we can do it on a per relay per relay request. We cannot evaluate how long the context was was or how long the the total response was. So we won't have that. And Will bandwidth latency be measured in the response input QS metrics for a provider? Yes. Uh, we have all the information that we need to, to, to know how many tokens at a time 
at least is supporting from our side, from the test bench side, and we will add that to the to the test bench in the future. But what we won't know, and it's impossible to know, is if that node, for example, we are we start to talk to a node and we send a prompt and expect for a response. We don't know if that node was also in session with another app, and that app already has sent it a lot of relays and it's choking the same LLM. So we cannot know that because we are blind of what other apps are doing in their sessions. So if we share a node with another app, it's difficult to know, but there are ways to like calculate when we are isolated with a given node and we are able to to control all the all the throughput of a given node. So if we put mind into it and work into it, we will be able to know like the average token time of a provider and the average time to a response for, for, from a given provider. Uh, it's not not coded right now, but I don't see yes, it. Yes, I'm, I'm working on that. Yeah, we are working on part of it, but not on, on all because... Uh, Shane is talking about the spoofing and the difference to to get to to blockchains. Uh, well, the the difference to we have discussed this many times, but the the main difference is what Shane says. Uh, a blockchain node has uh, when you request something to a blockchain node, the answer that you expect is a single one and is the true the true one when you ask something to an llm the answer could be one for example what color is the sky you can get blue and you can get a uh, light blue both are true or you can even get gray maybe it was cloudy and they are all true but they are completely different lexically so the truth is not something that you can do by uh, by a simple majority like you do in in blockchain nodes, for example. And and this is the root of the problem of the of why you cannot identify a model, because LLMs are so so sensible to not only temperature, but also to how you deploy them on that's meaning if you are you quantizing your model, if you are using 32 bits or 16 bit precision for the weights on your hardware, if you are implementing other things to to increase the throughput of your model, there, there are like a lots of and lots of things and, and which technique also you use to quantize your models. Uh, there are, there is a lot of techniques that will change a little bit how the, for example, how the the log likelihood of appearance of a given token is calculated, and and that changes completely how a model behaves while ha while having the same uh, quality of service. For example, um, you can change, you can quantize a llama three, eight billion, from thirty two bits to four bits, and obtain very similar scores. So it will be useful for you to use it, but they will provide completely different responses when you uh, when you check them word by word that they produce. So there is no way to proving maturity, and that changes completely how you measure an LLM on how you measure a blockchain node. The approach should be completely different because they are two completely different animals. Uh. I, I don't know if someone is following the the chat. There are too many messages. Uh, Nico, have you been reading that? Yeah, they are discussing. Okay. Yeah, if I can, if I can jump in, I think the the nature of the questions that Ian and Shane are asking are are around um, basically eval frameworks for gateways. So we'll need an open source eval framework. There's only so much that you can do on chain. There's only so much that you can prove on chain. But these eval yep. frameworks would include things like temperature, seed checks, um, uh, and a whole bunch of other types of strategies that, uh, of course, at the beginning, it'll be fairly simple. But it being open source, I think, collectively, they'll, they'll improve fairly quickly. But ultimately, what these are, are, are eval frameworks that 
determine whether this answer is good enough, depending on what the customer is paying at the end of the day. So yeah, you could you know index a bunch of answers, try to respond to them, but um, if they don't uh, 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 reflect on these eval frameworks, well then you know ultimately those nodes will get uh, won't get any more traffic from there, right? And I think on the economic side, this also plays into how much you know is being minted versus how much the end customer is being paid versus how much is being burned and these sorts of things. So um, uh, it's, it's, that's just kind of my clarification on the questions that Ian and Shane were asking there. My, yeah. my clarification I'd like to point out though, Michael, is what the difference here is basically this system is acting like watchers. So if you know, if you can identify the watcher, right, you can, uh, you know, always route those questions uh, either to a specific model or uh, you could have predetermined, uh, you know, answers if you just know the question. So I, I don't think it's it, it it's that complex to have a growing database, you know, that someone could just build of of answers to questions and then pre-populate those. What gateways actually don't do QoS in this system. Like in this system, it's entirely abstracted away because QoS is handled by this external system. They're almost like off-chain watchers. So gateways trust this rating system entirely, and they don't have any tools themselves to then do another kind of rating system. If each gateway is going to do this, these same, you know, 10,000 requests per, uh, per test just to know what node they're, uh, you know, what LLM model they're running, you know, that's, that, you know, there's no way that that scales because we can't have every single gateway flooding this much of the uh, LLM market with um, uh, QoS checks. So it does need to be centralized. And so to be clear, is, and, uh, you talked about starting with a static set like that, um, but the goal, I think, has been clearly understood to move towards a dynamically generative uh, test versus a static set of questions. Yeah, and exactly. That's what I was saying before. If this thing is dynamic, then you know, then you can avoid literally kind of script yeah. doing uh, attacks. Yeah. Which this would be a pretty straightforward I script mean, attack to just to do that. And people already do spoofing on pocket with blockchain nodes. So if they do it with blockchain nodes and, uh, you know, rewards are, you know, very, very small per relay. Um, and especially if there's going to be an economic system where we're going to, you know, 10x, you know, certain, uh, uh, certain LLMs in order to generate excitement around them, uh, there, there's going to be ample, you know, there, there's going to be ample reason for people to find ways around this. Um, and that's literally Pocket's entire track record, uh, you know, history of if there's a way to game it, people just do. Like, that's literally the nature of it. <laughs> so. Yeah, of course. I mean, this would be absolutely dynamic, right? Um, I mean, this is the beginnings of it, but, but I mean, I, I don't see why it wouldn't be dynamic on a gateway by gateway basis. basis. <laughs> Ultimately, we are delegating the trust to the gateways to, um, uh, operate with in, in this kind of a fashion and the economics protect against the self-dealing portion. Yeah, uh, I, I agree with what you say, Shane. I think I'm not so confident that it's only a, a simple script because there is a lot of more of, of of variability here. But yeah, we will need to transition into generative generative tests as soon as possible. But the problem is that any kind of generative test that we create will not be comparable to the rest of the world. So if we don't provide at least a point of interaction where someone from outside pocket can come and see how our nodes, how the models that are staked in our system relate to other kinds of models, uh, it's very difficult to say, to prove to them that we are actually hosting useful models. And I also want to to go back to a point that Michael made around uh, the fact that if a model is spoofing, it might spoof the leaderboard, but the gateways will know when it returns crap and stop sending it relays because they, they will blacklist them in at some point in time. And 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 that's it's a really, really, really important part of this system for I think for the whole pocket network. Because uh, regardless of how we do the test, for so suppose that we have a test that is fail-safe that no one can spoof, the that's 
a metric that is useful for maybe developers, maybe for the machine learning community also, but the people using it will provide their own scoring through usage because if they find a model that is good for them for any given reason, they will keep on using that model. And in Pocket Network, we will have like the world of LLM metrics and the world of LLM users all in the same place because we will be met measuring the models like we were doing science, but we will are also selling the nodes to real users that have real world use cases. And today there is like a big, big gap between real world use cases and how these metrics behaves. We have been studying that a lot. And I think that having those two metrics cor completely correlated, for example, knowing how a model behaves on a, on, on a lot of metrics that we can measure or we can add in the future and knowing how much it is used by the by the Pocket Network clients, it will help us and the machine learning community as a whole like to bridge that gap and to say why and to try to explain why people prefer one model over another and and finally i hope that we will be able like to explain what today is called like the model vibe a, a term that i hate personally uh, and find some kind of explanation and being able to tell yeah if you want a model for example to X, Y, or Z real world use case, you need to look at these sets of metrics or these types of tests. Some tests that today we don't know which they are because the world of metrics and the worlds of real world usages, usages for LLMs are completely separated or behind closed systems. So we don't actually know what happens. And that's, that's really, really exciting also for the pocket network. Yeah, I just want to jump in here. One of the things that the Pocket ecosystem has over every other solution in the Web3 ecosystem and beyond is experience. Right? There's no such thing as perfect email or the perfect uh, guarantees anywhere. Right? And we've proven this uh, over the last four years. Um, fundamentally, even if you use a Web2 centralized solution like Octo AI or someone else, and you're hitting a Llama 3, 400B endpoint, there's no way for you to know if they're just sending you a response from 8B behind the scenes to cut down their cost, right? So are we going to have the perfect thing straight out of the bat in six months or 12 months? No, we won't, but we'll be a step ahead of others. And we'll have a foundation that lets us go even further. Like as another example, tangential to that, you know, we wrote about TEs. And that's what every other inference project, decentralized inference project, is uh, uh, discussing in their light papers. Uh, there's a lot of discussion about how, you know, for 100000 or $200,000, you can actually hack a team. There's no perfect solution here. It's being okay with good enough. Um, and I think even if we get to that good enough solution, the network will provide a lot more uh, value to the end user than almost anything other anything out there that's competitive. Um, whether it's on the market or in the market in the future. Thanks, Osh. We brought you back from your silent watcher status. Always watching. <laughs> Yeah, Shane, that number is the combination and uh, yeah, yeah. and the to number put people of into context. Uh, oh, yeah, sorry. Nico calculated the number of unique tests that this framework has. It's like a, yeah, uh, indeed, one it... times ten elevated to twenty, something like that. So it's really, really big number. Yeah, it could be more because n is the number of instances that even could be uh, higher, but you have to multiply that by four because it's the approximately uh, prompts by instance that you have. So it's a very huge number. And as I said, if you track also logs by temperature, that number becomes 
could be considered infinite. Okay, so I guess so maybe that's my become a computational cost. Uh, yeah, Shane. I, I so I I think maybe my misunderstanding is how I guess these tests were presented. My from what it sounds like, the, these tests are basically industry standard set questions. You know, like uh, at, at at you know, like any uh, uh, you know, flip to the end of your textbook, and you have you know a bunch of example questions and answers. Uh, yeah. That's so. If there's ten thousand questions right in a test, um, and and you guys are randomly sampling them, you only need ten thousand answers to those ten thousand questions. So unless there's something different where this amount of questions are not established in like an open source format, uh, you know where people see exactly what the questions are, then I guess I understand what you're saying. But that's also then going to dynamic. Because when you when you posted that that calculation is eighty one trillion, so I don't I don't are, are there eighty one trillion questions you're saying there are? No, it, Shane, it, it's it's a little bit different. It's how you construct the questions are the same, but you will, will start changing them places on given some as examples, and then in other questions you instead of using them as examples, you use them as the actual question, is how the future, how, how they are constructed, meaning that there are 80 trillion different strings to to prompt the, the LLMs, that's truth. The concepts behind those, those are not 80 trillion different responses. And this is really getting into really technical, it's not that easy to construct a, as to construct a script to fool the system, but it's also not negligible that someone can fool this system, either using a script or training an LLM on these tests. And, and that's what happens today. And the, the greatest critics to these kinds of systems is not having someone to memorize all of the possibilities. It's having an LLM doing it for you because you can memorize the test sets of all these uh, of all these tests and and place that into the pocket network. Yeah, that that's probably true, and it will be probably much easier than to create a model or have a database of all our tests. You simply use the test sets as the train sets of your LLMs, and you, there is no way around that. So there are ways to fooling us. It's like it's a good first effort, in my opinion. This 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 benchmark not only because it's not that easy to fool but also because it gives us visibility into other communities but we will be creating generative tests in time there is no doubt about it i think so uh, just a call uh, we invite all to read the the report Probably oh, yeah. we, we could open uh, a channel uh, to discuss this subject. Yeah, th there is a channel on, on Discord where we talk about all the things in the all the things about AI, so we can talk about it. Yeah, but there is the 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 repository has a reports part where we discuss all this in written format. There are four different reports, and the last one will is about this. So I will copy this also to the chat if you want to read more about it. Oh. Beautiful. Thank you very much, Ramiro, for a long and deep dive yeah. uh, technical on where we are right now. Uh, everyone is pretty much hung in, so clearly it was a, a conversation that was worth having and worth listening to. And uh, the, the recording will be published out later on. Jerry will share that link when it's all set and done. So it's 1.30 and uh, time for us to wrap this up. Uh, yeah. We will be here again, same time, same channel next week, uh, and see you all then. Thank you, Chinks. Thank you all.